Hey, uh, my name is Nevan. I'm from Pivotal. I'm a platform architect, uh, developer by trade. How many developers are here? Wow, almost everyone. Great. Any operators of Cloud Foundry? Few of them. Great. Okay. I'll have to disappoint you. This is a more developer topic, but you're welcome to stay, please. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of insights in this talk, hopefully. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, the purpose of this talk is to explore some of the experiences that developers have with uh, using Cloud Foundry uh, and Kubernetes, and we want to look at those two platforms side by side and see uh, where should I deploy my apps? Why would I care about deploying on one or the other app, uh, platform, right? A few words about myself. As I said, developer. You can find me on Twitters and GitHubs and the other social media. Um, I did uh, post some source code for this, uh, so find it on my Twitter uh, or look at the slides later. So what is developer experience? Developer experience is a user experience that's applied to developers because developers are users as well, right? So what are some of the uh, experiences that developers have? Well, they use developer tools, IDEs, frameworks, libraries, APIs. Uh, and of course, they use platforms. So that's what I want to focus in this talk. What is the developer experience using these two platforms? Uh, specifically, we'll look at the Cloud Foundry, traditionally called uh, Cloud Foundry, or uh, uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime, and the Cloud Foundry container runtime, or uh, Kubernetes implementation of that. So before we get started, we probably should look at the pl Cloud Platform abstractions, right? So ultimately, everything runs on hardware. Uh, that hardware, we do implement some VMs uh, using hypervisors, virtualization. Uh, we do implement some containers on top of that. Uh, we have applications uh, that are leveraging some of that container uh, platforms. Uh, and finally, we have abstraction called functions as a service for your, some of the event-driven um, Lambda-style functional um, uh, workloads. So I'm asserting that the further you go up the uh, platform hierarchy, uh, your developer experience is going to be different. Uh, you're gonna need to worry about less things, uh, different things possibly, um, but also you would, might be limited in some of the workloads that do not necessarily, could not really run on the, on the, on the function as a service, for example. But that comes with a price, right? So if you want more flexibility, you need to worry about more things. So it's always a fine balance. Uh, where should I run my workloads? Anyhow, for more details, uh, look at Richard Sirotter's talk uh, from last uh, year's uh, spring one, December last year. Uh, he gets into details of these abstractions and uh, it's really great. Take a look. So what do I care as a developer? So what are the things that I typically, what do I do? I'm developing code, right? So I'm developing my apps. There's a purpose I do that, right? So I want to run those apps somewhere, right? So I want to maybe deploy those applications, prepare them from deployment, maybe deploy them to production, to uh, dev test, QA, UAT, five, seven different stages possibly, right? I might want to connect them to some external systems, databases, queues, uh, message queues, uh, maybe some other, uh, other microservices, stuff like that. Also, I want to update my application, right? I want to do uh, some rolling upgrades, possibly. Um, also, I want to see what's going on with my app. I want to look at the logs. I want to look at some metrics, some monitoring, stuff like that. And of course, I want to make my applications a bit more resilient uh, to, the, to the problems that I have uh, in my underlying infrastructure or, or, or the other apps. So there is a lot, a lot of different aspects of a developer's everyday life. So given that, uh, so what do I need to know as a developer, right? So of course I need to know how I build my application. How do I package my application? Maybe I need to containerize my application, so I need to know about the container image. Maybe uh, I need to build a Docker file. Maybe I need to, maybe I use some other technology, OCI compliant uh, technology. Uh, maybe I need to optimize this uh, container for, for some for the best performance, specifically with Java apps. We might want to look at some of the memory uh, heuristics. Uh, we want to optimize the, the size of the, the heap size, the, some of the garbage collectors and stuff like that. Uh, maybe I want to configure my application for logging, 
for monitoring. Maybe I want to do some um, uh, tracing of the application. Um, also, I might need to, there's maybe some different specifics about my platform uh, where I run. So no platform is the same, hopefully, uh, or yeah. Um, I do need to possibly configure my load balancing, my DNS, my certificates, a lot of different constructs. Need, need to configure security, some networking policy. So there's a lot, a lot of things that I need to worry about as developer. Would you agree with that? Who wants to, who wants to think about all these different things? Okay, one person, two people, okay. You must be an operator. <laughs> Anyhow, so here are some assumptions that I, that I that I assume that you know, so I'm not gonna go into details of that. Right, so I definitely know how you build your app. Uh, you probably know how to connect to the external systems. You probably used the Cloud Foundry before or Kubernetes, so you know how to connect to that. And how many of you have done CF push so far? Okay, good assumption, right? Well, we are at Cloud Foundry Summit, right? So let's take a look at the developers. Here are some things that I wanna kind of run through, and then we'll reflect on those and uh, draw some conclusions. So source code examples, uh, feel free to browse through them. I also recorded some demo screens and screencasts because I'm not gonna run demos, we only have half an hour here. Uh, but uh, happy to find us upstairs at the, uh, at the Pivotal booth, we can do some of those demos and we can show you some of the stuff. So self-service platforms make my life easy, who said that? Who would like to see self-servicing platform? I don't need to wait for all those tickets, right? I need to create my database. Oh, wait for 28 days. Okay, a week, right? Anyhow, so how do we interact with platform? Uh, both platforms are container-based platforms, so Cloud Foundry is container-based platform uh, based on Diego. Uh, Kubernetes uh, is also container-based platform. Uh, we interact in the same way, right? So we have a, a client, uh, we have essentially a developer API, uh, it's our contract with the platform. So with Cloud Foundry, that's CFCLI, there's other clients as well, other tooling, uh, and Kubernetes has a very similar uh, Go client, uh, kubectl or uh, kubectl, uh, many people call it differently. Uh, ultimately, it's the same thing, right? It's a, it's a developer API and a, interact with the developer API. So how do I log in, CF login? Uh, on Kubernetes, I actually need to get uh, credentials. I need to configure my kubeconfig file uh, for different platforms. It's very similar. Get credentials on PKS or Google Cloud for uh, GKR or AKS, EKS. There's a lot of different flavors. And finally, I, I can use my contacts for my specific cluster and uh, get details. How do I deploy an application? So here's an example. Uh, I call it the beer service. Uh, I guess uh, any objections to beer tonight? No? Okay. Yeah, anyhow. So it's a very simple Spring Boot Java app. Uh, ultimately, it's the same app for Cloud Foundry and uh, Kubernetes. Uh, on Kubernetes, I had to build a Docker file and I have some other uh, Java tooling. Uh, specifically, it's a Spotify plugin that helps me build a, a Docker image from my Docker file. Um, you don't have to do that. Of course, you can build that externally to your, to your Maven plugin or Gradle plugin. Um, you could just use Docker uh, build and, and build the image outside of your application. Great. Right. Uh, here are the, uh, you can readily download them, uh, look at some of the screencasts. It's a Java Spring Boot app. It could have been any other app. Uh, we at Pivotal, we really like Spring Boot. Uh, how many of you have played with Spring Boot? Just show of hands. Oh, nice. More than two thirds of the room. So how do we build an application? Well, very simple, clean package. Um, how do we push an app? Well, just see if push. Right, and the app gets deployed. Um, here I specify from a command line, I didn't use the manifest. I'll show you a manifest in a moment. How do I deploy it to Kubernetes? Well, very similar. I uh, build the application, but also I have extra steps that I need to push the application, uh, not application, I build an image, and image needs to be deployed to some registry, so that like Docker Hub or Harbor or uh, GCR, ECR, ACR, there is a lot of different uh, image registries. 
Uh, hopefully the image will get scanned upon your push, so for some vulnerabilities and things like that. Uh, your operator team can help you with that, uh, set up some of those things. Um, great, so now we have the image in the registry and we are ready to deploy this app. So I can do a command from a command line, I can run the image, and I specify my image with a sp specific tag, I run it on port 8080, but we are not there yet. Uh, I have a deployment on Kubernetes, but I need to expose my application as a service. Uh, in this specific example, I'm using a load balancer. So I expose my deployment called beer service and I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'm gonna serve it on a port 80. So these things are very similar, right? So CF push, uh, uh, Kubernetes, uh, uh, build an image, run an image. Uh, essentially there is an extra step where I need to build my image and push it to container registry. I can deploy it with manifests. Manifest for uh, Cloud Foundries should be very simple. Um, I could put more things here, number of instances, memory, um, how, many, yeah, how many instances, backing services, a few other things. Uh, and in Kubernetes, I have a deployment file and I have a service file. Uh, typically, we would combine those two, so it's a one single deployment, uh, well, deployment artifact, which is a deployment and a service. How do we scale an application? Well. CF scale or kubectl scale, right? So it's a very, very similar. Um, I provided here some uh, endpoint entries. Uh, they are slightly different. Um, Kubernetes, uh, we have the environment host name. When you deploy it to Cloud Foundry, uh, Cloud Foundry is going to provide some uh, VCAP services, uh, sorry, VCAP environment variables so we can see which instance we are talking to. Uh, connecting to database, um, so on Cloud Foundry, we have a readily uh, available marketplace that hopefully your platform team has configured. Uh, so I would have my pMySQL, my, my C, uh, uh, Postgres, uh, uh, or maybe some other external service that I'm gonna hard code and use a user provided service. And then those credentials would be provided to me uh, as environment variables. So my Spring Boot app can actually readily just uh, look at the environment variables, parse it, and use it, and cr uh, create uh, everything on fly. Uh, on Kubernetes, things are similar. Uh, I could possibly, because Kubernetes is really great for some data services as well, I could create my database right there, right? Um, or I could leverage some of the similar uh, service brokers uh, through the Open Service Broker API and I could create my services through the service brokers, through some config maps and uh, things like that. Great. Also I could create, I could connect to some other type of databases, NoSQL database such as Redis or Mongo. Um, also I could connect to some native public clouds. How many of you run on native public clouds? Uh, Google, Amazon, Azure, it's about half of people. The other half I would assume on vSphere or OpenStack. Yeah, great. So sometimes I do have some native public, uh, public cloud services, uh, such as data stores, um, blob stores, or some other constructs. Um, so at Cloud Foundry, we have uh, service brokers for each one of the clouds, Google, Azure, Amazon. Um, and we could leverage similar open source, uh, open service broker API as well to, um, to configure those on Kubernetes. How do I, how do I, uh, how do I up, up, update my application, right? So typically, both platforms do provide zero downtime application updates. Uh, Cloud Foundry traditionally um, uh, uh, provides that through the use of uh, blue-green deployments and through the mapping um, uh, alteration. Um, but that's often managed externally, right? So I would have a concourse or Jenkins that's driving my pipelines and implementing that blue-green deployment. Um, and we have a new tool coming up, uh, Spinnaker, that's going to orchestrate and sort of stateful deployments, continuous deployments. And I did reference uh, uh, two videos here, actually. Uh, They're interesting to watch. Uh, the other video, so one video is on Spinnaker from John Snyder from just a few weeks ago at uh, Spring uh, One platform in Washington, D.C. 
Um, great video. And the other video actually is that our Cloud Foundry uh, uh, team, uh, Cloud Controller API team, is working on a new CF push experience with a better push. So you actually have out of the box CF push experience. So it's not stopping deployment. Uh, on Kubernetes, that looks much, much, uh, uh, much easier. Uh, it's built in the rolling upgrades. Um, so also I have a uh, rollout histories and, and things like that, which is coming to uh, cloud controller as well. I can SSH into container, both platforms. I can look at the logs on Cloud Foundry. Um, I can look at the aggregated, uh, on Cloud Foundry I, I have a logregator that aggregates all the logs in a fire hose that I can redirect to some of my logging facilities like Splunk, Elk, uh, whatever it is, PCF metrics, hopefully. Um, on Kubernetes, that's not as, you have to build that yourself, right? So uh, it's, it's not trivial, but it's not hard either, right? So uh, you can, but each logs are uh, uh, separated for every, every pod. Uh, but you can tag them, you can redirect them all in the same spot, and then you get uh, a really nice uh, developer experience. Distributed tracing um, in Cloud Foundry, uh, Zipkin tracing is built in into the Go router. So out of the box you get that. Uh, if you're using uh, Spring and Spring Boot, uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth makes it very easy to uh, uh, instrument your, uh, your uh, services as well, add some tracing information. Uh, and it's easy because all the logs are aggregated into a single log stream. Um, on Kubernetes, it's not as trivial, um, so you have a bit of work to do, but uh, it's not hard either. So, um, this was a nice run up through the sort of experiences, so I'd like to reflect back, and this is just scratching the surface of the developer experiences. So, what do I need to know as a developer? Right, so on the Cloud Foundry side, we build an application. On Kubernetes side, we also build an application. Right? So we need to worry about how to build application. Okay, that's given. On Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry builds a platform image. Right? So it builds a container for you. On Kubernetes, you're the responsible, developer is responsible for building an image, container image, and pushing it to the registry, possibly do some Leverage the base image strategy, so th that's a very neglected, uh, I see that all the time in the, in the uh, enterprises. There's a sprawl of different images, and yeah, we love Docker, yes, great, but what is the corporate governance around that? So security team is gonna have a nice conversation with you, right? Anyhow, um, on Cloud Foundry, uh, that's managed by the build pack, so the build pack is the one that, um, that builds an image for you, there is, uh, they're provided by your favorite vendor, right? Uh, and vendors are providing the, the, the build pack and changes in the, in the, for example, Java build pack, JDK, um, uh, Java options, and uh, there's a lot of goodies built in into these build packs. Uh, fortunately, build packs have graduated as an as a incubator project on Kubernetes as well, cloud uh, CNCF. Um, so we'll see uh, build pack technology as well uh, being brought to the uh, Kubernetes world as well. So uh, that would be great. Um, on Cloud Foundry side, we have a very rich uh, existing uh, marketplace that I can readily that's readily available. On Kubernetes, I need to build a lot of these things, right? So what are some of the other things that I need to do on Kubernetes? Well. Um, I probably need to write those manifests, right? So I need to know a lot of things before I can write one. Um, there's a lot of different objects and replica sets and deployments and, and services and uh, stateful sets. And there's a lot, a lot of components in Kubernetes that I kind of need to understand what, what it is so I can write my manifest successfully. Um, yes, I could leverage some of the uh, manifest writing utilities like Helm or there's a few other ones, uh, I'll mention them in a moment. Um, also I need to understand some of the specifics of my Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes cluster can run on your vSphere cluster or OpenStack possibly. 
uh, or on public clouds. So they are not exactly the same. Some of the networking constructs are different. Some of the storage constructs are different. So I need to know these little, little details when I'm writing these uh, manifests. Right? And hopefully we'll templatize some of these manifests and build uh, uh, Helm charts and uh, other installations for our platform. So I talked about the build packs. Uh, so they're traditionally reserved for Heroku and Cloud Foundry platforms. They're coming with the cloud native build packs. Um, so that's great. Uh, definitely watch this video. Actually, I think uh, Steven is here at uh, Cloud Foundry. There was a talk on build packs. Uh, but do watch the Spring One uh, video as well. Uh, build packs anywhere. Uh, it's really great. Uh, they really delve into the why this is a good thing when you do unpatching. So it's more kind of operator. Uh, would really, really love this when they need to upgrade their 500 apps that are using the same base image that has problems. So do you want to update 100 or so images, rebuild them? Well, use build packs, right? Anyhow, um, so definitely increased security posture, increased developer productivity for every workload, operational efficiency, uh, and things like that. So what are some of the specifics of the Kubernetes platform that I need to know? So we said native cloud providers are uh, quite different. So GKE, EKS, AKS, um, native cloud providers, maybe PKS uh, is running on GCP or Amazon or possibly on-prem with vSphere, OpenStack. Yeah, people, uh, PKS is a Pivotal uh, container service. It's a uh, Kubernetes managed by Bosch. Um, so some of the networking constructs are different, load balancing, networking policies. Uh, storage, uh, storage is quite different. Uh, luckily, we have storage classes that, that our Kubernetes operators can, uh, can configure. And then we as developers can just uh, uh, use those storage classes to configure our uh, uh, persistent volumes and PVCs and things like that. So how do I write my manifest file for my app? Well, as I said, you need to know some of these characteristics of the cluster. Uh, you probably also need to know the architecture and object constructs, right? So deployments, replica sets. Um, there's a number of tools that help us with that. So maybe we're going to leverage some of the um, uh, projects that someone else wrote. So I need a MySQL or Kafka or something. Um, I might use some of the existing Helm charts or Gitcube, KSonnet, Scaffold, MetaParticle. So there is a number of, of tooling that help us uh, build this uh, and, and templatize our uh, Kubernetes manifests. OK, great. We just scratched the surface, right? So OK, we have an app, but how do we expose the app, right? So definitely we need to understand the specifics of our cluster. Um, we need to understand the various constructs, load balancers, labels, services. Um, I might need to choose. There is a lot of different ways that you can do things in Kubernetes. So which is the right way? Which is a, what are all different trade-offs, right? So cluster IP, node port, load balancer, external name. Uh, I might use some of the ingress controllers that are given to me. Um, and then finally, we would add a service description to the manifest. So back to the point. So what do I need to know as a developer? Well, on Cloud Foundry, I, my responsibilities are around the app. So I'm, my artifact that I'm producing is an application. On Kubernetes, it's, a, it's an image. Right? So it's an image that I'm deploying to Kubernetes. That is described with manifests, deployment and service manifests. And uh, that's, a, that's a fundamental difference, right? So the, the things that we need to know uh, are much larger at the Kubernetes world. There is different ways that we can do things. Um, and therefore, our uh, resp responsibilities are bigger as well as developers, right? So, so where should I run my application workloads, right? So if you're developing apps and you worry about uh, time to market, deliver as fast as you can, um, lines of businesses are breathing down, down your neck, right? And you got to deliver features, 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 right? So how do you deal with a, with a constant change and that fast-paced delivery? Um, well, Cloud Foundry can help, right? So for your custom-built software on Linux and Windows, uh, for those modern cloud-native applications, 12-factor, uh, 4-factor, uh, polyglot web applications, APIs, batch jobs, 
Uh, Spring Boot apps. If you're writing Spring Boot apps, probably Cloud Foundry is a much better fit. Okay? Okay, but that's not enough, right? So we don't write just cloud native apps. We don't write just those, right? So we have a bunch of other workloads that are, uh, that are going to run next to our uh, Cloud Foundry. So for those type of workloads, um, stateful workloads, uh, maybe you don't have a source code. Maybe a, a vendor packages the software and provides the image. So for that kind of software, probably Kubernetes is a be better fit. Uh, some of the short-lived apps, some of the workloads, um, maybe there is a Helm chart. It's easier to install it that way. Um, maybe for some apps that have a non-standard uh, ports, networking, uh, some of the legacy applications, it's easier to port them to Kubernetes first. Uh, and of course, data services. So there is a Kafka, Greenplum, MongoDB, there is a lot of different data services um, that have uh, readily made uh, 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 Kubernetes manifests. So that is it. Uh, thank you for the questions. I did pr provide the uh, references, so I'll take a few questions. Uh, and I'll see you at the Pivotal Boot upstairs, maybe demo some of these things. Thank you. Nevin, um, could you go to the previous slide? This one? Yep. If, if we would consider to use Kafka next to Cloud Foundry for mm -hmm. yeah, a st a temporary storage or whatever, huh? okay. um, then you propose to, did I understand well, that you propose to install Kubernetes for that? Uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, it depends. There is actually a really great talk. I'll, I'll send you the link um, at Spring One. On there is a Confluent, is a company behind Kafka, right? So there is a really great story around uh, how to deploy Kafka on on the platform. Uh, so yeah, that's the idea. I would probably use Kafka, and I would use Kubernetes to deploy that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have another way, someone else is managing your Kafka clusters, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jurgen. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about is, is bridging the gap between those two, uh, mm -hmm. because we have customers that are deploying their Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes and are using the Open Service Broker API to exactly um, run the backend services on the same Kubernetes cluster that the Cloud Foundry is running on. Um, and I believe that at the moment the easiest way to have a single platform um, where you can run basically everything and have the very good developer experience on the Cloud Foundry side and, and the operations part on the, um, on the Kubernetes side. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, was that the question or statement? No, it, w it was <laughs> like, um, where do you see this, this bridging the gap happening? Is yeah, this well, that's, that's exactly right. So we, we, we do need both, right? So we need data services. We need to run them somewhere. So running them side by side is perfectly fine and acceptable and uh, desirable. Right, uh, and uh, having Bosch under the covers is a big win uh, because of all the operational aspect. Me as developer, I really don't care, right? I can connect it to anywhere I want. Uh, I can, through the service broker, that can be created for me. Would that be on a public cloud somewhere? Or ultimately, I don't care, it's just an endpoint, right? But from operational standpoint, the operators really care about uh, managing those, right? So if you do have, those data services and you want to manage them, Bosch really helps you patch those, right? So because they run on some VMs and Bosch is going to help you uh, uh, manage the, well, sorry, uh, that's under the covers, under the Kubernetes, right? But uh, the Kubernetes is, is going to help you manage those, those uh, data services, right? So they're going to get restarted and you have all the benefits of, of, of our enterprise resource management that Kubernetes provides. Sorry, I confused it there for a moment, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions? There's time for one more question. I think we have about 30 seconds left. Well, thank you, everyone, and see you at the Pivotal booth.